This podcast is the property of the Half Blood Princesses. I'm Demi. I'm Jess. The story will begin in a flourish. Hey everybody, welcome to episode two of the Half Blood Princesses. This is really exciting, and we have a fun episode planned for y'all. Yes, totally, and we are all about the social media, so if you guys don't follow us yet, please do. We are on Twitter and Instagram at HB Princesses Pod, and you can also find us on Facebook and YouTube by searching The Half Blood Princesses, a Harry Potter podcast. We also have a voicemail line. Leave us a message and we might feature it on a future episode. The number is 412-228-5435. And now just tell everybody our topic for episode two. Our topic is potions class. We are going to dive deep into some lessons and talk about the teachers. Now let's get into our quote. It's time for Quick Quotes Corner. Today's quote comes from chapter 8 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone called The Potions Master. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making, he began. As there is little foolish wand waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stopper death, if you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. This quote was spoken by Snape during Harry's first ever potions lesson after Snape takes roll call. Harry describes Snape's eyes as cold, empty, dark tunnels, and his voice as he talks as a whisper with the ability of keeping a class silent without effort. Snape's appearance, coupled with his words, are meant to intimidate the first years into thinking that what he has to teach is so important and so complex that they couldn't possibly grasp it. The fact that he calls them dunderheads is the icing on the cake. This tactic scares the students into paying attention. Bottling fame and brewing glory in a softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, however, suggests that not only is the art of potion making complex, but it's also beautiful and, if done right, highly rewarding. The fact that the students have to utilize their mind, resources, patience, and control to create a potion shows that the prowess with which one has to make a good potion is cultivated over time and painstaking practice. Also, like art, some students may specialize in creating one great potion and be mediocre at brewing others. Still, it should be noted here that like any class, potions may not be for everyone. The beginning of this quote when Snape says, you are here to learn the subtle science and the exact art of potion making really jumps out at me because I think it's super interesting that he referred to potion making as both a science and an art. Of course it's a science because it reminds me of chemistry. You have to mix things together to get some kind of end result, in this case a potion. And also like when you're doing chemistry labs, you have to be really focused and pay attention to the instructions because if you do something wrong, it could have disastrous effects. Looking on the art side of things, I feel like if you're talented at potion making, you can be really creative. Just think about how in the wizarding world, potions are used as medicines. So somebody had to create those. So in order for them to create these medicines or these potions that these wizards are taking, you have to be like, what if we tried this? What if we added a counterclockwise stir after a clockwise stir? Or what if we tried a different ingredient? And so on to be able to create this potion. So you have to think outside the box. And I feel like that is a very creative and artistic side of potion making. You can also see this too with Snape's Half-Blood Prince's book, because as we're going to talk about later with the draft of living death, Harry follows Snape's notes and he's able to create the potion quicker and more efficiently. And obviously Snape was able to come up with this alternative way of making the potion because he's so skilled at potions. So he was able to use his creativity and think outside the box and try something new. 
Hey, Polly's here, and I really hope that she's bringing me and Jess our potions ingredients because when we were doing our back to Hogwarts shopping in Diagon Alley, we totally forgot to get them because we were too busy looking at books and flourish and blots. And if we don't get our ingredients, Snape is going to be so, so mad at us. Oh man, it's just the fun facts. <laughs> Hey, it's Polly or Owl. She's flying in with the fun facts. Thanks so much, Polly. Now let's learn some interesting things about potions. According to A Journey Through Potions and Herbology by Pottermore Publishing, potions have been made for thousands of years to make medicines, drugs, and poisons, and even to conjure different weather events. Historically, if a person had a cough or headache, they would go to a local apothecary shop. There, the apothecary or pharmacist would open up his or her book of remedies and treat the patient. This book contained a list of symptoms as well as colored illustrations and recipes with natural ingredients for prescriptions. Historians found guides that date back to ancient Chinese, Babylonian, and Egyptian societies. Interestingly, apothecaries were high status in those societies and were often wealthy. In the Middle Ages, apothecaries had signs outside their shops in the shape of a unicorn's head. The sign was used as a logo for the apothecary and as a signal for illiterate patrons. The unicorn on the sign wasn't real, but the horn was authentic, except that it was actually the tusk of a narwhal. Narwhals are whales and are known as the unicorns of the sea, on account of the spiral pattern on their tusk and their rather elegant physical appearance, somewhere between a dolphin and a whale. Many people believed the horns, or the tusks, could cure leprosy, were a potent aphrodisiac, and were even antidotes to poison. Right up until the 1780s, the French royal family had unicorn horn, in the form of a narwhal tusk, dipped into their drinks to proof the drink against poison. As a result, these tusks were often expensive. Queen Elizabeth I owned two of them. She added one to the crown jewels of the United Kingdom. Instruments of the apothecary trade include the pestle and mortar, which mean pounding and pounder in Latin, and apothecary jars. Jars from 17th century Spain often included hand-painted flower designs. Common ingredients found in the jars include vitriol, coral, blue vitriol, or copper sulfate, which was used in dyes and by apothecaries to induce vomiting, occle canker, crab's eyes, really a stony mass taken from the stomach of a purified crayfish, used ironically enough to ease stomach ache, and sang draco, dragon's blood, purportedly the blood of dragons or elephants, but actually a bright red resin from a tree found in Morocco, Cape Verde, and the Canary Islands, Dracaena Draco the Dragon Tree, used to treat ailments like hemorrhoids as an ingredient in 18th century toothpaste and today as a varnish for violins. Speaking of ingredients, bezoar stones are actually real things. You may recall that in Half-Blood Prince, Harry shoves a bezoar stone down Ron's throat after he drank some poisoned mead intended for Dumbledore. Bezoar stones are masses of undigested fibers that form in the stomachs of certain animals, especially of the bezoar goat, that were antidotes to poisons. Noblemen, kings, and popes would put these stones in gold filigree cases to show that they would not get poisoned, and that they were wealthy enough to own such exotic goods. In his book, The Complete History of Drugs, Pierre Pomé tells readers how to get a bezoar stone. People could get them from a cow or a goat, but the best ones come from a really rare ape. Now that we've learned a little bit about potions in the real world, let's go back to Hogwarts and brew up some magical potions of our own. Now, it's time to dive into the book topic of the week for tales of magic and mischief. Welcome to potions class, where your dreams might come true or the cauldron might burn down. Harry's first potions lesson is in Chapter 8 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which is called the Potions Master. Sadly, it's double potions with the Slytherins. Potions is held in one of the cold dungeons at Hogwarts, with pickled animals floating in glass jars all around the walls. Okay, let's take a seat. Seriously though, 
Doesn't this place creep you out? Yeah, it definitely does. I would not want to have class there. I'd be super distracted by everything in the jars, and I would not be paying attention. Oh, yeah, me too. I'd also be wondering what the specimens are and how long they've been there. Yeah, I know. I think there's, like, one part of the books when Harry's in Snape's office. I think it's during one of the Occlumency lessons, and he has a bunch of stuff in there, too. And I think Harry's, like, wondering about one of them, but then he's like, oh, wait, I don't want to know. Yeah, but also during one of those lessons, one of them explodes, and it's super weird. Yeah, no, I don't like Snape's uh, jars. We don't like this. So already, the dungeon is cold, the atmosphere is scary, and to make matters worse, Snape comes in. He's taking roll, and he stops at Harry's name, and he says, Ah, yes, he said softly, Harry Potter, our new celebrity. That's kind of rude. <laughs> I would hate to be singled out, especially by a guy that kind of scares me. So, Harry's already in for a wild ride. Snape explains a little bit about potion making and singles Harry out. What would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Harry is super confused and says he doesn't know. But Snape's not done with him. He keeps firing questions at Harry. He asks him about where he would look to find a bezoar and about what the difference is between monkshood and wolfsbane. Each time, Harry admits that he doesn't know the answer, and Malfoy and crew laugh. In between questions, Snape also criticizes Harry for not opening his books before he came to school and says that fame clearly isn't everything. Poor Hermione has her hand raised for the first two questions before she stands up with her hand raised for the third question. I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does, though. Why don't you try her? Snape is not happy. He tells Hermione to sit down and answers his own questions. This is super interesting. He says that asphodel and wormwood are the ingredients for a powerful sleeping potion called the Draft of Living Death, which, ironically, we're going to discuss later. Foreshadowing! Here's some Greek mythology for everybody, which I think is super interesting, and it shows a lot about Snape's character. The Asphodel Meadows is a section of the underworld where ordinary souls go after they die, and also Asphodel gets its name from the Asphodel flower, which is, ironically, a kind of a lily, and we know the whole thing with Snape and how he loves a lily. Also, Wormwood is often associated with regret or bitterness so i just think it's super interesting that this is harry's first patient's class so they pay him because of the whole thing with lily and he's kind of sneaking these things in that's really cool and it's almost like if he took that potion it's the draft of living death so he's basically living his regrets and dreaming about the person he loves while he's sleeping yeah really really weird really weird that's super interesting Next, Snape answers his question about a bezoar, and he says a bezoar is a stone found in the stomach of a goat. And as I've mentioned earlier in our fun facts, it'll save you from most poisons. Snape also says, as for monkshood and wolfsbane, they are the same plant, which also goes by the name of aconite. Well, why aren't you all copying that down? As people scramble to take notes, Snape takes a point from Gryffindor for your cheek potter that's such a british thing to say i know i literally laughed the first time i read that because it's so over dramatic and theatrical like i couldn't help but laugh it was really funny i mean if i wasn't so scared of snape i would think i was watching a movie just the way that he prowls around the class yeah i know it's so great Things didn't improve for the Gryffindors as the potions lesson continued. Snape put them all into pairs and set them to mixing up a simple potion to cure boils. He swept around in his long black cloak, watching them weigh dried metals and crush snake fangs, criticizing almost everyone except Malfoy, whom he seemed to like. One of the ingredients is horned slugs because Snape is praising the way Malfoy stewed his. Then, acid green smoke fills the air along with a loud hissing sound. Poor Neville had melted Seamus's cauldron. It's the kid's first day, and this is what happens to him. The potion seeps across the stone floor and burns holes in people's shoes. The whole class jumps on their stools to avoid the potion, but Neville isn't lucky. He's drenched in it. Snape calls Neville an idiot and says, 
I suppose you added the porcupine quills before taking the cauldron off the fire. Snape tells Seamus to take Neville up to the hospital wing, then he turns on Harry and Ron, who are working next to them. Snape blames Harry. You, Potter, why didn't you tell him not to add the quills? Thought he'd make you look good if he got it wrong, did you? That's another point you've lost for Gryffindor. So, right away, we see here that Snape has picked favorites. He's picked Malfoy because he's from his house, and he obviously hates Harry, which Harry will figure out why later, and he's picked Neville to bully. This is not a normal teaching style. Yeah, and I also think that is really bad here, too, because when you meet a new teacher for the first time, have a first class with them, a first impression is very important because if a teacher scares you at first and you get a bad vibe from them at first, that kind of damages you for the whole rest of the class. So this is just a terrible first experience, especially at a magic school. Harry has no idea of what any of these things are yet. And Harry seems like the kind of person who'd be eager to learn potions. And now it's just like, why even try? Yeah, I mean, Harry has had classes already before this one. So I'm glad this wasn't his first class at Hogwarts. But still, you're right. He has so much pressure put on him because he's famous. Snape isn't making things better by saying, oh, you're famous, you should know this, you should do this and this and this. That's not an okay assumption to put on someone. Harry just wants a fresh start at Hogwarts, which is what we talked about with Hagrid at the train station, and this isn't really a fresh start for him. He's already being judged because of what he did, and instead of being celebrated for killing Voldemort, he's being picked on, and he doesn't understand why. Yeah, it's just an all-around terrible situation. I feel really bad for him. And also, to me is right, it is damaging, because if you're scared of a teacher like Neville obviously is, you're not going to do well in the class. The responsibility of the teacher is to make sure that all kids are comfortable in this environment and to help them out with whatever they need. Yeah, and it's not only, like, a fear, it's also, like, a lack of motivation. Like, if you are being treated terribly by a teacher... You're not going to want to even try or like have motivation in that class because even if you do do a good job, like that's not even going to be acknowledged anyways. So like why bother? Yeah. And the fact that he is insulting Neville instead of saying, hey, are you okay? Is a total red flag here. Yeah. He probably didn't even go up to the hospital wing to see if he was okay. No, and it was an honest mistake. Like obviously school is a place to learn and grow. Neville made a mistake big deal. All Snape could have said was, hey, I think you added the porcupine quills before you took the cauldron off the fire. Next time, add the porcupine quills after. And then, you know, he'd learn from that. But he's not learning from this because he's scarred from it. It shouldn't be scarring every time you make a mistake. It should be a learning experience. And Neville's not going to want to learn. He barely even wants to be in this dungeon. Whereas, if you look at it in Hermione's perspective, she's like, ooh, a challenge! I'm gonna rise up to the occasion. Whereas, if it were me, I'd be like, see ya! Also, it should be noted here how dramatically Snape prowls across the classroom. He's like a big black spider that just kind of follows you. And as Ron is afraid of spiders, I'm surprised Ron isn't really scared here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like, it's like he's looking over their shoulders and it's not like in a nice way to see like how they're doing and to be like, hey, do you have any questions? Like it's in a completely negative way where he like is looking for mistakes to call students out. And the setting doesn't help things either. You're set up to be scared by walking into this creepy dungeon. You can't really enjoy potion making if the atmosphere is dark and gloomy and terrifying. Yeah, I think I'd honestly enjoy potions if Snape wasn't teaching it because you get to like mix things together and create cool things, especially in the later classes that we'll get to in six. Like they make cool things that I would want to make, but having Snape, it's like I'm scared to try to make this and I'm afraid of failing. Exactly. So let's talk about the Boyle's potion. So, the ingredients for the Boyle's Potion, as mentioned in the scene, are dried metals, crushed snake fangs, stewed horned slugs, and porcupine quills, which are to be added after taking the cauldron off the fire. The additional ingredients in the Book of Potions version, Zygmunt Budge version, 
are pungus onion, flobberworm mucus, ginger root, and pickled shrake spines. The recipe for the potion, according to Magical Drafts and Potions, is crush six snake fangs in the mortar, add for measures of the snake fangs to your cauldron, heat to a high temperature for 10 seconds, wave your wand, allow the potion to brew for 45 minutes, put four horned slugs in the cauldron, add two porcupine quills to the cauldron, stir five times clockwise, and wave your wand to finish. The Book of Potions describes this potion as being an effective remedy against postules, hives, boils, and many other scrupulous conditions. If it isn't brewed correctly, it may cause boils instead of cure them, as we saw with Neville. Wouldn't you like to give that potion the wrong way to an enemy? Yeah, I was really just thinking, like, too bad Draco didn't get a face full. I would have laughed. Well, at least he got hit with the bat bogey hex later in the books. <laughs> yeah, I know. I wonder why Snape picked this as the first potion. I honestly think that boils and pimples and things are a problem for teenagers, and it's relevant to their age group, so that's why he picked it. Plus, apparently, it's a very simple potion. Yeah, I agree, and I also think it's really important that this potion can be applied to their lives. And Snape picked this easy solution to cure boils instead of a random potion that they couldn't do anything with. Yeah, I mean, keep a bottle of it by your sink in your bathroom and take it in the morning if you see something you don't like in the mirror. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, Snape sucks, but shout out to him for actually picking a pretty useful potion. So now that we've talked about the lesson, let's talk about the teacher a little bit. We've already dipped into some of the pros and cons about Snape, but we're going to dive even deeper. So Snape only has a few pros in my book. First of them being that he picks relevant potions for his lessons, which we just talked about. Also, he's a knowledgeable potions master with years of experience. I mean, think about the Wolfsbane potion he made for Lupin. That's really complex, and he was able to just whip it up and just bring it to his office. Snape also easily spots problems with a potion and knows immediately how to fix it. Let's face it, some of these more complex potions, if you don't do them right, can be fatal and disastrous, and the fact that Snape knows exactly how to fix it is pretty important. I thought of all those things too, and one thing I would like to add is I kind of admire Snape for having control. Because I've had a lot of teachers who are very laid back and don't have control of their class and things get out of hand very quickly. So yes, Snape is really stern, but he doesn't let any BS happen in his class and he gets things done. Yeah, I agree. Potions is a very complex science and it requires a lot of attention and focus. I like how you said it's a science because this literally makes me think of like my AP chemistry class because... The very first thing we're told, like, we all have to sign a paper that we won't mess around in the lab. Like, when you're making, like, chemicals and mixing them and doing labs and everything, like, you are not to screw around. So, my AP chemistry teacher was super funny and nice, but he, like, wouldn't let anything fly. So, we can kind of see that here with Snape. Yeah, so if you're a science nerd, potions is your class. Yeah, exactly. All right, lastly, let's talk about the cons, the not-so-good things about Severus Snape. We talked about earlier how he favors the Slytherins and targets and humiliates students he doesn't like, such as Neville and Harry. Snape also assigns a lot of homework, and he acts as though he's above teaching children, as all of them are morons. Like, he actually calls them dunderheads. He deducts Gryffindor's points as if it's going out of style, He gives detentions, a lot of them, and he's probably an unfair grader. Like, I bet he would have failed Harry if Dumbledore wasn't headmaster. I would also like to add that Snape really discourages his students and makes them afraid to ask questions. He also punishes them when they make mistakes instead of approaching it as a learning opportunity. He also treats Hermione like total crap because she's very eager to learn, and instead of embracing that and making her feel like she can have this learning experience. Snape shuts her down every single time. And the last thing I would like to add is that Snape literally lets all of his past problems with James and Lily affect the way that he treats Harry. 
And I think that's ridiculous because Harry is one of his students. And instead of giving him a chance to show that he could be a good student in potions, he immediately shuts him down and treats him badly because of his personal problems, which teachers shouldn't do. Yeah, and like I was saying earlier about humiliating students, he really bullies Neville during the whole lesson where they're supposed to create a shrinking solution, and Neville is not doing well. Luckily, Hermione helps him so that when they feed it to his toad, the toad doesn't die. Last, I would like to add that Snape maybe doesn't like Hermione because she's similar to Lily, because Lily was very good at potions, as Slughorn talks about, and Lily was also muggle-born. Yeah, that's a really good point. And again, that's personal stuff. So he's targeting Harry and Hermione because of his own personal problems, and that is so ridiculous. Like, what teacher does that? It's so wrong. Like, oh, I had a crush on your mom, and I hated your dad, and I mean, like, your mom was muggle-born, and your best friend's muggle-born, and, like, she's really smart, just like Lily, and I don't like either one of you. Like, what the heck? I completely agree. That is so unprofessional. It really is. All right, now we're going to talk about Half-Blood Prince. Harry doesn't think that he's going to be taking potions this year because he got an exceeds expectations OWL, and Snape only accepts students who get outstanding. But this all changes when we find out that Slughorn is a new potions master. When McGonagall is checking all the six years' schedules, she notices that Harry isn't scheduled for potions, and she is curious about this because she knows that Harry wants to be an Auror, and potions is a class that you need to take to become an Auror. So when Professor McGonagall asks Harry about, you know, I thought your ambition was to become an Auror, Harry says, It was, but you told me I had to get an outstanding OWL, Professor. And so you did when Professor Snape was teaching the subject. Professor Slughorn, however, is perfectly happy to accept any WT students with exceeds expectations at OWL. Do you wish to proceed with potions? Yes, said Harry, but I didn't buy the books or any of the ingredients or anything. I'm sure Professor Slughorn will be able to lend you some, said Professor McGonagall. Very well, Potter. Here's your schedule. So that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and Hermione head to their first double potions class with Slughorn. To everyone's amazement and curiosity, when they walk into the room, there are potions on display. Harry, Ron, and Hermione share a table with Ernie McMillan near a gold, Harry's favorite color, cauldron with a lovely potion inside that we're going to talk about soon. Now then, now then, now then, said Slughorn, whose massive outline was quivering through the many shimmering vapors. Scales out, everyone, and potion kits, and don't forget your copy of Advanced Potion Making. This is when Harry tells Slughorn that both he and Ron don't have books or ingredients, and Slughorn is super chill about this. He tells them that they can borrow ingredients from the store cupboard, and also that they can borrow scales. He also gives them old books that are in the classroom that they can use until they can write to Flourish and Blots to get their own. I love Slughorn here. He's so chill about this. He doesn't punish them, whereas Snape would be like 50 points from Gryffindor. You guys are unprepared. No, I think Snape would just kick him out of the class and be like, listen, you don't have the materials, you can't take my class. Yeah, that's super accurate. That's totally what he would do. And then he'd sweep across the room in his cloak, and he'd point at the door and be like, Out! Out! You disgust me. I could seriously see him looking down his long nose and saying, You disgust me. Yeah, it's so great. But obviously, Slughorn is not like that. Also, the atmosphere of the room is really pretty. Snape's dungeon was gross and disgusting and cold, whereas Slughorn's is warm, you got the potions brewing, the pretty vapors going, you automatically feel at ease and welcomed. Harry is intrigued in a potions class for the first time in his life. So then Slughorn tells the class that he prepared some potions to have on display to show them for interest, and these are potions that they would all be able to create when they complete their NEWT level of potions, and they all probably heard of these, even though they haven't made them yet. So then Slughorn starts going through the potions. Anyone tell me what this one is? He indicated the cauldron nearest the Slytherin table. 
Harry raised himself slightly in his seat and saw what looked like plain water boiling away inside it. Of course, to nobody's surprise, Hermione answers and tells everybody what potion this is. It's Veritas Serum, a colorless, odorless potion that forces the drinker to tell the truth. So here's some fun background information on Veritas Serum. So the name of the potion gets its name from Roman mythology. I love my mythology. So the Roman goddess of truth, truthfulness, and sincerity is Veritas. She is a virgin dressed all in white and it is said that she hid in the bottom of a holy well so she wouldn't be found. Well, clear water, get it? Yeah, it's awesome that she not only took the name from the mythology, but also kind of got into the color of it too. And her dress is white, which symbolizes purity, so it's like pure truth. Yeah, love it. Oh, yes, I love this. Veritas Serum is such a powerful truth potion that three drops alone will have the drinker spilling their innermost secrets. I would literally be terrified to have this. Like, I don't really know what truths I would spill, but I know there would be some that would come out of my mouth and I'd like totally regret every word coming out of my mouth. Yeah, this potion is cleansing in a way because it cleanses you of any secrets you might have, but Umbridge probably would have used this for torture. And I don't know if I'd want to take it either. I mean, I don't have any deep, dark secrets, but I'd probably just tell you stories about embarrassing things that happened to me. The use of Veritas Serum is controlled by very strict Ministry of Magic guidelines. Also, an alert wizard can protect themselves from Veritas Serum by keeping an antidote around. According to Snape in Order of the Phoenix, it takes a full moon cycle to create Veritas Serum. Though we don't know 100% if this is true because this is what he said in front of Umbridge, but let's just go with Snape's accuracy here. If you think about the way the potion looks, it's very bright and beautiful, and so is the moon. And also the moon is white, and Veritas Serum gets its name from Veritas, and she's a goddess who wears white. Alright, so I'm going to wrap up my little Veritas Serum fun facts with some notes from J.K. Rowling. Veritas Serum works best upon the unsuspecting, the vulnerable, and those insufficiently skilled in one way or another to protect themselves against it. And now this is something I think is super interesting. So Sirius Black was never given the opportunity to take Veritas Serum when he was accused for the deaths of Lily and James and the muggles that were killed by Peter Pettigrew. So this makes me think that Veritas Serum is kind of used during criminal trials to get the accused and witnesses to tell the truth. So I just think this is kind of like ridiculous that he wasn't really given a fair trial because he wasn't given the opportunity to tell the truth. That is interesting. I mean, if you think about how in Goblet of Fire, they just gave it to Barty Crouch Jr. to confess everything that he did, they should have given it to Sirius. The wizard and justice system is corrupt, guys. So the next potion that Slughorn points to is the Apologies Potion, as Hermione answers again. Harry too had recognized the slow bubbling mud-like substance in the second cauldron, but did not resent Hermione for getting the credit for answering the question. She, after all, was the one who had succeeded in making it back in their second year. I love how Hermione made this complicated potion when she was only in her second year, a potion that they're learning to make when they're in their sixth year. That just shows how smart and amazing she is. That is interesting. This potion is really complex and many witches and wizards are afraid to brew it because they don't want anything to go wrong. But Hermione was just like, yeah guys, let's do it. No big deal. So Polyjuice Potion enables the consumer to take on the appearance of another person as long as they add a part of the person's body to the potion. You can use toenails and dandruff among other things, but the most common thing people add into the brew is hair. So poly actually means many in Greek. And I would infer that the name of the potion means many juices, which are many juices to turn into different people. It's like the many juices of their essences. That's really cool, right? Yeah, it's super cool. I love how she like actually puts a lot of thought into naming the potions and they hold so much meaning just about what they're called. Wizarding World says the idea that a witch or wizard might make evil use of parts of the body is an ancient one and exists in the folklore and superstitions of many cultures. Hermione found the ingredients and instructions for brewing the potion in most potent potions. 
Along with the body part, the ingredients are lacewing flies, leeches, flux weed, knot grass, powdered horn of a bicorn, and shredded skin of a boomslang. The flux weed must be picked at the full moon, and the lace wings have to be stewed for 21 days, meaning that the potion takes a month to make. Here's the full moon again. What is so special about the full moon? I don't know. I feel like the full moon, like the moon cycle, is like looking at ancient times and mythology. Like the moon cycle is like very frequently mentioned and involved with these kind of things. And given that she takes a lot of her things from ancient stories and myths, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, it is really interesting that these complex potions have that in common. Yeah, I love that. So as we just talked about in the scene, the potion looks like thick, dark mud and bubbles sluggishly before the bit of the person is added in. When that ingredient is added, the potion froths and changes colors, but the color varies depending on the person supplying the ingredient. Here's some interesting things that JK says about the potion. I remember creating the full list of ingredients for the polyjuice potion. Each one was carefully selected. Lacewing flies, the first part of the name, suggested an intertwining or binding together of two identities. Leeches, to suck the essence out of one and into the other. Horn of a bicorn, the idea of duality. Knot grass, another hint of being tied to another person. Fluxweed, the mutability of the body as it changes into another. And boomslang skin a shedded outer body, and a new inner. That's so freaking cool. I never knew that. This blew me away when I read it, and it's so cool because the potion is used in so many of the books that I'm really happy she actually thought through these ingredients. Most potent potions says the dose lasts for one hour, which is proven in Chamber when Ron and Harry become Crab and Goyle, and in Goblet when Barty Crouch Jr., turns into Moody as he's constantly drinking from his flask, but we see the rule broken in Deathly Hollows during the Flight of the Seven Potters, also during the trip to the Ministry, and the time in Godric's Hollow. These trips must have lasted more than an hour, and the characters didn't take another dose of the potion during these times. I don't like this inconsistency here. It really bothers me, especially because the potion is used in so many of the books. Like, all she had to write was, hey, they're drinking from the flask, and she didn't. Yeah, it especially bothers me in Deathly Hallows because the potion is something that they really rely on, and it's kind of used as a plot device, and the things, like you said, that they do definitely lasted longer than an hour, so she was just like, oh, forget that part. They're taking Polyjuice Potion to go to the Godric's Hollow. They're taking Polyjuice Potion to go to the Ministry. And I'm like, well, what about the hour restriction? Yeah. I mean, you couldn't have done those trips in an hour. Absolutely no. No way. Yeah, I know. It really bothers me. Oh, well. There's nothing we can do about it. As we've seen, consumers of the potion can become a different age, sex, or race, but they cannot change species, as exemplified when Hermione becomes a cat in Chamber of Secrets. Hermione's mishap caused an incomplete transformation which required skilled medical treatment to undo. So shout out to Madame Pomfrey here. I'm surprised they didn't get in trouble. Like, she didn't ask questions, she just healed Hermione and they were on their merry way. I think it's really interesting how you said you can't transform into another species, which makes me wonder, like, what if you got Polyjuice Potion and took a hair from, like, one dog and then gave it to another dog? Like, would the dog change breed? I'm not sure, because in this series, only wizards drink it, and you can't change species that way. Then again, is it safe for the dog to drink it? Yeah, I don't know. What would happen? Nothing, or... I don't know. I mean, I feel like there'd be some kind of transformation just because, like, when Hermione turns into a cat, like, she isn't a full cat, but she has, like, the hair and the tail and the ears and stuff. But I'm just curious, like, if anything would happen if an animal took it. What if an animal took it and there was a human hair in it? Oh, would the dog, like, turn into, like, part human? I gotta know the answer to this. That would be really cool. I know. I know. That's so cool. 
So the next potion Slughorn points out is Amortentia, which Hermione answers again, and she tells the class that it is the most powerful love potion in the world. Slughorn tells her that she must have recognized it by its distinctive mother of pearl sheen, and Hermione says that she also recognized it by the steam rising in characteristic spirals. Hermione also says, It's supposed to smell differently to each of us, according to what attracts us. And I can smell freshly mown grass and new parchment and... And then Hermione trails off and doesn't finish her sentence, but J.K. Rowling did confirm that the third scent that Hermione could smell is Ron's hair. How cute is that? We love them. That is so cute. Also, I love how she smells new parchment because that is the best smell. Like, I literally go into bookstores just to inhale the scent, and then I walk out. Yeah, I agree. And, like, freshly mown grass might be there just because, like, I don't really fall head over heels over freshly mown grass smell, but, like, there's a lot of people who love the smell of, like, cut grass. And I don't know what connection that really has to run. Maybe, like, at the burrow and, like, the whole atmosphere, but, like, I think it's so adorable. I agree. It could also be because she's muggle-born and her parents might mow the grass. So it might remind her of her house. Yeah, so cute. I love it. So at this point, Slughorn loves Hermione. She's becoming a favorite because she's getting all these answers right. So he asks her to introduce herself. And when she says Hermione Granger, he turns to Harry and is like, oh, is this the friend that you spoke so highly of when we met and all that? And when Harry says, yes, I'll proudly, Slughorn is like, all happy, especially because Hermione's muggle-born, and we know Lily was one of Slughorn's favorite students, and she was muggle-born. And Slughorn is overall delighted and gives Hermione 20 well-deserved points for Gryffindor. He's such a nice teacher. I know, he's so nice. Like, he treats Hermione the way she deserves to be treated. So, as I mentioned a little bit ago, when Harry sat down at the table next to the Gold Cauldron, I said it was a lovely potion. Well, he sat by Amortentia, which we gotta love. And at the beginning of the scene, when Harry sat down next to it and kind of smelled it, this is what Harry smelled. Treacle tart, the woody smell of a broom handle, and something flowery that he thought he smelled at the burrow. Which is so adorable. Clearly, this is Ginny. Yes, it definitely was Ginny. Oh my god, they're so perfect together. Alright, so here's Slughorn on Amortentia. Amortentia doesn't really create love. It is impossible to manufacture or imitate love. No, this will simply cause a powerful infatuation or obsession. It is probably the most dangerous and powerful potion in this room. I don't know about that. I would think the Veritaserum is more dangerous. Do you think Amortentia is the most dangerous? As we'll talk about later, Felix Felicis, if taken in large quantities, has some bad side effects too, so it's anyone's game as to what's more dangerous. Telling the truth all the time and getting tortured, getting tortured by transforming into another species with polyjuice, um, the bad side effects of Felix Felicis, or this one? I don't know, I guess it's a matter of opinion. Yeah, I get where he's coming from too though, because like, taking this is not true love. So it can, like, make you believe that someone's falling in love with you when they actually aren't. So it can be, like, more dangerous for, like, personal reasons, like your mental stability and, like, emotional well-being. But as they say, the clear potion is always the most dangerous. So if you're asking my opinion, I would vote Veritaserum, too. Yeah, I think Veritaserum is probably the most dangerous, just from, like, what we learned about them. All right, friends, here are some fun facts about Emertensha. So as Hermione mentioned, Amortentia is the most powerful love potion in the wizarding world. The word Amortentia comes from amor, which is Latin meaning love, and tensia, which is taken from potential, meaning power or ability. Love potions in general are tainted with falsities, and this is seen when we look at the history of Voldemort's parents, because Marope used a love potion on Tom Riddle Sr., to get him to fall in love with her and she consistently gave him this love potion but when she stopped and the potion wore off she thought that tom would still be in love with her and clearly he wasn't so this just shows how this potion really truly does not create true love 
Another thing about amartensia that's very interesting is that love is part of the human experience that is studied in the Department of Mysteries. And the locked door in that circular room when Harry and crew go is called the love chamber. And though nobody really knows what exactly is in the room because the whole point of the Department of Mysteries is that everything's like a mystery, but it is rumored that a fountain of amartensia is in that room. Okay, so let's talk about what we think would happen if y'all fell completely into that fountain. So if someone really wanted you to be with them and they brought you into the Department of Mysteries and threw you in the fountain and made you sit there for a couple minutes and took you out, would you be permanently damaged and love that person for a really long time? Maybe. I mean, like, but also, like, would you actually have to drink it or, like, just... Being, it's like a, it's like being baptized in the Hortensia Fountain. <laughs> You're rebirthed. You love again. Yeah, I wonder what would happen if you don't actually drink it. Like, would it just like seep through your pores and like permanently be in your bloodstream? Like, I don't know how that would work. Also, it's like you're being baptized. Your old life is gone, and your new life has just begun. Like, I just imagine someone taking this potion. And the guy, what, the guy who wants the girl just, like, leading her around on a leash, like, here you go, honey, we're going this way. <laughs> <laughs> would you even mentally be there anymore, or would you just be focused on the person that you're looking at? You could be, like, a glassy-eyed puppet doll. Yeah, I know. And, like, obviously, like, when we see, like, when Ron takes it by accident, when it's in the chocolate cauldron, like, it is, like, like Slughorn said, an infatuation. So after talking about Amartensha, Slughorn's basically like, okay guys, we're gonna start class now. And Ernie's like, but sir, you didn't tell us what's in that one. And he's talking about the black cauldron on Slughorn's desk. The potion within was splashing about merrily. It was the color of molten gold. And large drops were leaping like goldfish above the surface, though not a particle had spilled. Of course, Slughorn knew this potion was still here that he didn't talk about, and he put it off for dramatic effect. And he does his, aho, and tells everybody that it's a curious little potion called Felix Felicis, which Hermione tells everybody is liquid luck, and it makes you lucky. Obviously, the whole class is super interested and gives Slughorn their full attention. And Slughorn also gives Hermione 10 more points for sharing what Felix Felicis is. Yes, it's a funny little potion, Felix fully says, said Slughorn. Desperately tricky to make and disastrous to get wrong. However, if brewed correctly, as this has been, you will find that all your endeavors tend to succeed, at least until the effects wear off. So then Terry Boot is like, well, why don't people just take this all the time? And Slughorn basically says that if you take too much of it, it can cause giddiness recklessness, and dangerous overconfidence. Slughorn also says that he's taken this potion twice in his life, and those turned into two perfect days. And that, says Slughorn, apparently coming back to Earth, is what I shall be offering as a prize in this lesson. There was silence in which every bubble and gurgle from the surrounding potions seemed to be magnified tenfold. One tiny bottle of Felix Felicis, said Slughorn, taking a minuscule glass bottle with a cork in it out of his pocket and showing it to them all. Enough for 12 hours of luck. From dawn till dusk, you will be lucky in everything you attempt. Slughorn also mentions that you cannot take this during organized competitions like exams, elections, and sporting events, and the winner is to use it on an ordinary day. And they will watch as this ordinary day becomes extraordinary. All right, so... What I find interesting about this potion is that it's golden in color, so your day is golden. Like, there's nothing wrong with it, which I think is really interesting. So, actually, the words Felix and Felices are the same word, but they're differently declined, and they both mean lucky, which, as we know, the potion is called liquid luck. The drinker gets an exhilarating sense of confidence and a tremendous sense of opportunity. Also, like we said, all of the drinkers' endeavors will succeed. Along with giddiness, recklessness, and dangerous overconfidence, large quantities are also toxic. The potion was invented in the 16th century 
by Zygmunt Budge, which we talked about him earlier, so that's kind of cool. He gave some of the potion to a muggle-born guy named Tertius. Tertius found a bag of gold in Diagon Alley and got a job at Gringotts as a curse breaker. How ironic is that? The potion ingredients include one ashwinder egg, horseradish, squill bulbs, an anemone-like growth on a mert lap, a tincture of thyme, alchemy eggshells, and rue. According to the Book of Potions, there are many steps to brewing the potion. First, you add an ashwinder egg to the cauldron. Then, add horseradish and heat the cauldron. Juice several squill bulbs with a mallet. Add them to the cauldron and stir the mixture vigorously. I just imagine here someone stirring the mixture and going, I'm going to get lucky, I'm going to get lucky, I'm going to get lucky, I'm going to have a good day, and like freaking out about it. Chop up the anemone-like growth on the back of a mertlap. Add it to the mixture and heat the cauldron. Add a dash of tincture of thyme and stir the mixture slowly. Grind up an alchemy eggshell and add it to the mixture. Stir slowly. Then heat the cauldron. Add a sprinkle of powdered roux. Stir vigorously. Then heat the cauldron one last time. Finally, wave your wand in a figure eight over the cauldron and say, Felix Empra. The word Felix Empra can also be broken down with Felix meaning lucky and Sempra meaning always forever. So you are forever lucky. So after Slughorn shares about Felix Felicis, he tells everybody to turn to page 10 of advanced potion making and asks everybody to attempt to make the draft of living death. The student that does the best will win, and I quote, my fabulous prize. So Harry opens his book and gets to work, and he's super mad because whoever owned this book previously has written through it, has annotations in the margins, and crossed things out. So he's very annoyed. Harry also notes that everybody was looking around to see what they all were doing, and this is both an advantage and disadvantage to potions because you can see everyone else's work, but at the same time, nothing is private. So how would you feel about this? I'd feel a little violated because I'm trying to do my best over here and there's some people looking at me. It might make me nervous and I might screw up, honestly. Yeah, and I was always a person who was, like, super focused, and I concentrated a lot, and I did my best work, and I would be worried that people were copying me. That'd be my biggest fear. So, naturally, Draco tries to suck up to Slughorn the way he did with Snape, but Slughorn isn't falling for Draco's BS, so Draco just has to work hard for once to do a good job instead of having Snape favor him. Also, Harry is following the annotations in the book, much to Hermione's annoyance, because for once in a potions class, Harry's doing better than her. So here's a little bit about the draft of living death. As just mentioned earlier in Snape's first potions class, it is a very powerful sleeping potion. Also, as we mentioned in this potion, you add powdered roots of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood. So, based on what we get in the scene, these are some steps and ingredients that are used. You cut up the valerian roots. Within 10 minutes of creating the potion, the classroom is full of bluish steam. A smooth black currant colored liquid is mentioned as the ideal halfway stage. Advanced potion making says to cut up the sepulphrous bean. But the annotation in the book says, Crush with flat side of silver dagger. Releases juice better than cutting. So if these instructions are followed, the bean releases a ton of juice and when it's added into the cauldron, the potion turns the exact color of lilac described in the book. Advanced potion making says to stir counterclockwise until the potion becomes clear as water. But the annotation says to add a clockwise stir after every seventh counterclockwise stir. There's a magic number seven. Are we surprised? When Slughorn calls time's up, he says that Harry's potion is the best, and then Harry wins the bottle of Felix Felicis. After the potions class, they go to the Gryffindor table for dinner, 
and they're talking about the whole situation. Harry explains about the book and its annotations. Hermione gets super mad and basically accuses Harry of cheating. But Ron says that it wasn't exactly cheating. Harry was just following different instructions. But Ron is also salty that he didn't get this book that had been written in. Judy comes over and is super mad because she overhears that Harry was taking instructions out of a book. And we all know why she is super mad because of the whole thing with the Riddle's diary. But Hermione thinks that Ginny has a point and tries to see if there's anything wrong with the book. Hermione takes the book, raises her wand, and says, Specialius Revelio, and taps the cover. Obviously, nothing happens. Harry snatches it back from her and it slips out of his fingers and falls onto the floor. It falls open and scribbled in the bottom of the back cover in the same small cramped handwriting says, this book is a property of the Half-Blood Prince. Also, shameless plug to our podcast is called The Half-Blood Princesses, and we just thought it was awesome that the Half-Blood Prince's book is mentioned in this episode. Like, we couldn't have planned this better. A mini shout out to Snape. I'm not giving him a big one, but I'll give him something. So like we did with Snape, let's talk about pros and cons of Slughorn as a teacher. So the biggest thing for me is like right off the bat, he accepts Harry into his class with exceeds expectations, which shows that he believes in the potential of his students. He also treats Hermione well, as we were talking about earlier, by allowing her to answer questions and giving her points when she answers questions to kind of reward her. Also, despite being a Slytherin, Slughorn is very accepting of Muggleborns, and this shows in how he treats Hermione, and also in the way that he talks about Lily. Slughorn also gives prizes to his students to reward them for their good work as seen with the Felix Felices. He's also very understanding that his students might make mistakes, and instead of criticizing them and giving them negative feedback, he allows them to learn and grow. And going off of this, he takes the time to look at everybody's work at the end of the class to see how they all did and give them pointers. I agree with everything that you said. And he is literally the polar opposite of the way Snape teaches. Because Snape just gives detentions and deducts points willy-nilly. Snape's basic philosophy is that if you don't do well, I don't treat you well. Slughorn is the polar opposite of that. He also has many years of experience and is a good potions master. He lectures really well, seems like a fair grader, and really cares about his students' well-being. So when Ron gets poisoned by that mead, he really does care and hopes that he feels better. Yeah, exactly. And another thing I like to add is, like, he allows his students to feel interested and wants to create, like, a fun learning environment. Because, like, when they walk into the class, like, these potions are on display. And instead of starting a class, like, okay, guys, we're going to make the draft of Loving Death, he, like, introduces them to any WT potions by showing them, hey, guys, these are potions that you've probably heard of, and these are things that you'll be able to make. So it kind of evokes, like, excitement. And, like, oh, my gosh, Veritaserum Prologies Potion, Felix Foley says, I'll be able to make that? I love how Slughorn has a positive outlook on everything that he does and teaches. He's like, oh, well, if you get it wrong, that's okay. If this happens, that's okay. I'm here for you. I'm at my desk. Just come and talk to me after class, which is really important because if you're struggling in a class, you need a teacher's guidance, and Snape doesn't offer that guidance. No, and this just is making me think about how Neville didn't get a good OWL grade, so he wasn't able to take potions but i'm so curious to see how he would have done in slughorn's class because snape isn't there to terrorize him the whole time like i'm sure neville would have done like a decent job so i only have one con for slughorn and it's kind of going along the same thing with favorites but not to the same extent as snape slughorn kind of just picks students based on like who their family is or people who are like prominent in some way and the way that he treats Harry and the Slug Club members is different. But at the same time, like, I feel like that's a natural thing for all teachers. You're going to have favorites, but I just think Slughorn doesn't do a good job hiding it. I agree. I feel like he's overzealous with everything. And his favorites are there for his personal gain. Like, one of his past favorites gives him Quidditch tickets every year. <laughs> 
I don't know. Yeah, but like I feel like looking at him just as a teacher, like yeah, he treats them a little different, but he's not like he likes Harry more, but it's not like the situation with Snape where he favors Malfoy and treats the others like crap. Yeah, he might talk to Harry more, but that doesn't mean that he tells the other students they're doing bad. So I feel like he has more control over it. So we learn about a lot of fantastic and interesting potions from these two lessons. So just out of all of them, which potion would you most want to have? I would honestly take Felix Felicis because it would give me the confidence I need to finish writing my manuscript or to even send out query letters. Yeah, I know. I love Felix Felicis too. And I just feel like if you have Felix Felicis, it kind of covers the other ones. Like, okay, so think about Veritaserum. You want somebody to tell you the truth. But if you took Felix Felicis and go up to somebody and be like, hey, tell me what actually happened. You're going to get lucky and they're going to tell you the truth. And with Amartensha, you don't have to take love potion to get somebody to fall in love with you. It could naturally happen. And that even happens with Harry because when he's leaving through the portrait hole, he bumps into Jenny when he's under the invisibility cloak. And Jenny thinks that Dean is like helping her through. So that causes them to fight. So like that could help with like the love side of things. And like with Polyjuice Potion, like you wouldn't have to sneak around or like hide or disguise yourself if you have Felix Felicis because if you want to go somewhere unseen then that would help you do that. I agree it really covers the other potions and with the boils potion you're not gonna break out if you're lucky that day and you're gonna get a good night's sleep if you're lucky that day. So Felix Felicis is a win for us. This episode was super fun and we definitely learned a lot in our potions class. Let us know what your favorite potion was and what potion you would take. Make sure to tune in for our next episode, which comes out on Friday, October 2nd. Thank you guys so much for listening. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this chapter of the Half-Blood Princesses, a Harry Potter podcast. Hedwig's theme and leaving Hogwarts in this episode were originally composed by John Williams and arranged by me. Until next time, Mark this page with a magical bookmark.